This is Twit. All right, so let's talk AI code. Oh, oh. I, I know what we don't talk do? about this much. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> What's up? Well, with but it, I think Jeff? this is this is very forward looking. But Gen two is saying no to AI code, meaning they don't want any code which has been generated from an AI. If you break it down, though, I think you'll see that they where they're coming from. And, and like I said, I think it's forward looking. Uh, as mentioned in the It's Floss article, which is linked in the show notes, there isn't a month that goes by when you don't see an AI lawsuit about whatever AI generated thing derivative of someone's, uh, you know, they, they created something which is derivative of someone's copyrighted material and that AI didn't have permission to eat up the original material or learn from it or they, they didn't, weren't supposed to, whatever. So Gen 2 is taking a proactive approach by this, by not waiting for a lawsuit. They want to avoid that altogether. This, and this has been talked about for a while. C Council member Michael Gorney first brought this up back in February and gave a few reasons. The first we touched on about many AI tools have been trained on copyrighted material. Mm -hmm. And Michael commented that a large language models, also known as LLMs, can create code where he describes as plausibly looking bull shingle. Note that last word was an editorial creative license on my part. It was what you think it was. Uh, the other concern was ethical. And he was basing it on energy resources needed to run these large models and concerns about layoffs and exploitation of IT workers. You know, as with anything, there are details to hammer out. And finally, on April 14th, they had a, a vote and it passed with six votes in favor and zero against. So Michael was quoted by the register and it's a link in the article as well. I think it's a good PR move for Gen2 right now when a lot of projects are being enthusiastic about AI. I feel that many Gen2 users really appreciate the old school approach to software engineering where humans matter more than productivity. Uh, Michael also goes on and says it, he admits that it won't be easy to tell human code written from AI code but they want to put it out there what's acceptable and what is not. They did have a note in the motion that AI code could be revisited and marked as okay if they can prove there are no copyright, ethical, or quality issues. They want to make sure as the entire AI scene changes quickly, they have the ability to change as well. Now all the concerns are met, they are more than willing to implement an AI tool and even say that could lead to higher quality code. So Gen 2 isn't locking out AI forever. It's just until it can meet the criteria set forth. And personally, I think it's good to get ahead of this. And I think they did smart and left themselves out if there's a, left themselves and out if there's a change in an AI model. You know, it, it gives good code. It's not on, trained on copyrighted. You know, it's ethical. Okay, they're willing to use it. Mm -hmm. So they're not saying never. And... Well, I can see what they're saying about energy and IT people abuse. I think the biggest thing, and this is my personal editorial, is to not have a lawsuit for which to an open source group, it can be devastating depending on how deep the attacker's pockets are. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can have one of these big, huge media places that could just destroy an open source group because they just legally pound them into nothing. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it was a good forward-looking statement from Gen 2, and I, I think it's a smart decision for me, for me personally. I, that's what I think. Uh, any yeah. any comments from my co-hosts? So the the thing that is the, the most interesting here is the application to Copilot, because that's that's Microsoft's GitHub thing. Uh, and uh, we have somebody in the, in the comments, Carl in the comments, is essentially saying, you know, what programming ai what and then he also makes the statement that only open source code can be used by ai i unfortunately have news for you copilot at least in the beginning got trained on all of the available github code not just the open source stuff even and the private stuff yes. you're saying right yes github i don't know if this is still the case but when it was first launched it was it was trained on private repos as well um and then yeah, uh, AI can write code. And sometimes AI can actually write code that compiles and does what you want it to. Not all the time, but sometimes. 
uh, it's actually fairly impressive. Um, I wonder, I mean, I don't disagree with uh, them not allowing AI, especially the way things are, but I wonder like in the future, if it's, if it, it's going to be harder and harder to not have code with some AI backed with just, you know, the yeah. way IDEs are going and they're going to have them built in. I suppose, I suppose there'll be niches out there for, for that need, but yeah. Um, and, and I think I, some of it's just a legal defense too. keep in mind that if, Hey, we want to sue you. Hey, we already say, we don't want this in here. If somebody snuck it in, we'll get rid of it yep. cause you said so, but you know, we, we were actively trying to stop copyrighted material in our source code. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there's, I, there's no r way for it. You know, if I'm writing code for something like, ah, oh, how do I, how do I do this? Hey, Copilot, how do I write this? You know, something real simple. And I mm -hmm. just put that in there and, and, you know, if it's real basic enough, it, it's, it's not going to, be a problem yeah, there, either. there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of questions about about this and like so even you could get into the question of well how much code do you have to use at once from copilot so in that exact example how many lines of code does it have to be for it actually to be copyrightable as opposed to fair use mm -hmm. um and you know that's something that that kind of played a role in the google in the java case the big you know android versus oracle i think it was um and when you actually got down to it, like the number of lines of code that were copied was like it was 11 lines of code and it was all very, very functional code. And so the, the first court case, you know, the one where the presiding judge actually had a clue, he, he threw that out and he said 11 lines of co functional code. This is not even copyrightable. It's entirely fair use um, so that you. you to get answers on this, we will have to have we will have to have court cases, um, yeah. and I I kind of hate that that is the way this is, but you, we are going to have to have court cases on what LLMs mean for copyright and some other questions. But that's the big one. Um, I mean, it could go down to like what is a for loop, and it gives me you know two yeah. three lines of code, however it formats it out is like. Yeah, but but but, to, but, it, but that's to answer some of the... these, yeah, to answer some of these these real basic questions about it though, where it is going to have to be tested in court, does running anything, but in this case computer code, through the LLM, the large language model, through that learning algorithm, is that um, enough? Is it is it transformative enough that it can be essentially a new copyright, or is it a derivative work. I believe that's how the, the legal jargon would go. And what that boils down to is, are we violating the copyright of this code? You know, particularly if it's if it's not open source, you know, if it's not already in public domain, are we violating the copyright of it to pull it into an LLM? And so far, we've not gotten, you know, enough legal cases that have looked at that and made that decision. And, you know, maybe there'll also have to be laws written about it, too. I, I don't know. It'll be a combination of the two, I'm sure. Well, and that's how Gen 2 is going to have to enforce it, too. It's going to be more of a recommendation to an extent. But then at mm -hmm. some point, knowing that if a lawsuit comes out of it, you know, that's where it goes back to. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. and I think you could even probably take a lot of analogies from some of the patent type stuff hmm. where how how trivial is it? I mean, OK. Mm -hmm. You know, some AI tells you how to make a for loop, but that's pretty basic. I mean, it's how, how would you say you didn't get that from just some code book or an example on the Internet or, how you know, because you could even look at when Oracle was trying to sh I think it was Oracle or one of them was trying to sue Linux for s a specific thing that was how Linux did something. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, 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 it's totally how we did it. It was one of those. <laughs> or maybe it was SEO. It was one of the patent troll companies. And this was, this was probably 10, 15 years ago. But it is basically only one way to do what they right. claimed was theirs. And I think that's where you're going to run into, if you say, hey, I need a library. Let's go back to Rockm. I need a library to decode compressed video. And it writes one. Then you're going to have a lot of, wait, this really looks like Mm -hmm. You have a complex piece of code versus, oh, it's a 
for loop or it's a, a comparator or something, yep. you know, and, I, and that's why I think the minutia is going to come into it. Yeah. And I'm not even questioning the, the legal aspect of it. I mean, yeah, that's how this will play out. I'm just saying, technically speaking, if I do that and I commit it to uh gen two's code, technically I'm breaking their, their terms unless they actually clarify that deeper in there. But if, if their terms are no AI used in their code, technically I am. It's like, oh, I forgot how to do a for loop. Well, I'm just going to ask here quick. Yeah. Technically. Yeah, well, so I mean, you could make the argument, is, isn't is Google run by uh, AI now? And if you look it up on Google, aren't you violating it? I mean, so, <laughs> you, you, there's kind of a reduction to absurdity argument that you can make there. And I, I, I don't know. I don't, that's definitely not what, that's not what they're looking for. That's not what they're after. My um, intelligence and, is artificial, and, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and the, even in the article, it, it, the the person that proposed it, Michael, even says, yeah, they're they're going to have a hard time telling what was AI and what was somebody writing code. It's not going to be enforceable until a lawsuit comes in. I mean, it's going to be impossible to tell. Uh, well, so some some code submissions they're going to look at and be able to tell this was not written by a real person. This was written by AI. Well, because some of them they're just going to be ridiculous. Um, yeah. But or yeah, that's when you Jeff's code. <laughs> <laughs> Why would anybody do this? I, yes, oh. yes, that's a that's a valid question. Well, no, but I guess the other interesting thing about this is there are, in fact, there are a lot of people right now trying to figure out how do you determine if something was made by AI. Uh, so when you're talking images, text, um, is there a way? Like so, in the academic world right now, they're going nuts trying to figure this out. How can we feed a student's essay into something and determine was this essay written by? chat gpt or is it original work i like, thought there is that a, existed but well there's been i don't know that wells works but it doesn't it doesn't work well but there are attempts at it um but i mean this is something that in a lot of different uh realms is is very much needed and i don't know it may also it may always be a cat and mouse game as the the ai gets better and then the ai detecting ai gets better and i don't know we'll see what happens oh Oh, fun. Yeah, and, and right now, the easiest way to tell is when you have, you know, I've seen somebody write something that they write it, you know, whatever grade level, and then they they send an email and it's like, well, this is a doctoral thesis. They don't use these words, you know. <laughs> uh, I, the, one of the one of the more fun things that I've seen suggested is the email will eventually and we're almost there. Email will eventually devolve into one person writing bullet points and ChatGPT <laughs> turning it into prose. And then on the other side, ChatGPT turns that prose back into bullet points. And that is what email will eventually consist of. Hey, it's Leo Laporte. I hope you've enjoyed this little clip from our programming at twit.tv. For more, visit our website, twit.tv, or subscribe in your favorite podcast client. There's also a link somewhere down there. <laughs>